Okay, and uh, I'm just going to give the, give the, give myself a moment. I'm going to share this real quick. Um, actually, I think, I think it's okay. Um, unless the side of the book. Hi, folks. Just give me a couple moments. I'm just going to um, share out the the link to people who may not have seen it um, due to some technical difficulties. I'm having to host the Hangout on on my page as opposed to the Silingual page. In the future, well, I'll, I'll have that fixed. Um, so I want to welcome everyone to, you know, anyone who's actually watching out there um, to the very first um, off the beaten tenure track Hangout with uh, and today we have Jeannie Garbarino. Uh, reason, the big reason why I wanted to start profiling people who have left academia um, to do other, other careers is that when I left or made the decision to leave academia, I couldn't find any role models or, or anyone to actually communicate with about this decision to leave. And while the statistics have, have not changed too much uh, since I left, the truth of the matter is that 75% of people who get PhDs do not go into academic careers. And while uh, I knew that was true at the time, I still had a very difficult time finding those 75% of people to talk to about my experiences. And it's, uh, we can go into detail about why that is, but that's not the point of today. The point of today is that we're going to talk with Jeannie Garbarino, who has very recently left academia. She's now the director of science outreach at Rockefeller right. University. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of just jump into that. If you haven't yet already, you can go to the Silingual.com site and find uh, Jeannie's interview that, that was posted last week. That's a great interview, and there's a lot of really good information there about you know her experience leaving. So one of the things I wanted to to talk more in depth with you about Jeannie is, you know, when you made the decision to go, how did how did that happen? How did that go about? Um, I think it wasn't. Uh, you know, I woke up one day and decided I'm going to leave the bench and I'm going to do something different. I think it was a very gradual kind of uh, realization. So. Um, Getting a tenure track faculty position at uh, a major research institute in my geographical area, which is my hometown um, around New York City, I, you know, it, it just didn't seem like that was going to be a reality for me. Um, there are so many people competing for so little space uh, as a tenure track faculty uh, researcher in some of the institutions around here, and I just wasn't um, my science. I loved it. I love doing bench work. I, you know, it wasn't like I was just tired. I mean, I got a little tired of the troubleshooting over and over again. There was a couple of Western blocks that I wanted to throw out the window. But um, I, you know, I, I just my 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 paper, my publication record was was is good. It's just not good enough for um, getting a faculty position at an institution like Rockefeller or Columbia or Einstein or any of the, the neighboring institutions in, in my hometown. And so I tried to hold on to the idea that I might be, um, I re I, you know, I tried to hold on for a long time to the idea that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get a cell paper or I'm going to get a science or a nature paper and that's going to carry me through into uh, a faculty position. But uh, I didn't get one in my PhD work, and it was it became pretty clear that it just wasn't going to happen for my postdoc work. Though I did publish in, in nice journals, I just wasn't getting that top paper that would push me into that pool of um, attractive candidates. Mm -hmm. So that's when I realized that uh, unless I was willing to pack up and perhaps move to another geographical location where there's less of a supply and more of a demand, um, I, it just wasn't going to happen. So, you know, we can talk about in, in the future why it's such a crazy model that academic or, or tenure track faculty need a cell or nature or, or whatever paper to, 
to be qualified to be a, a, a PI, but you know, how did how did your lab react when you told them that you didn't want to be a tenure track faculty or that you were you were considering pursuing other career and a different career as opposed to a tenure track faculty? Uh, it, it wasn't there. It was it was a non-issue. I mean, my my PI uh, probably one of my favorite people on this planet. So. Um, yeah, he, he's Jan Breslow. Uh, he's been at Rockefeller for a really long time. Um, he's been just a, a really, really solid support for me and my career. And he was more concerned with me figuring out what I wanted to do in life than, you know, him getting, you know, enough information out of me or enough enough data out of me. And he he was really supportive. So it wasn't. It wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, when I first started the lab, um, I had already had a pretty good relationship with him because my PhD was just right up the block at uh, at Columbia, and it was in lipid metabolism. So there, and uh, his lab studies cholesterol as it relates to atherosclerosis, uh, the development of that of that disease. So I, um, I we have overlapped in a number of different occasions at several meetings that we have. Some of our local meetings. There's something called the New York lipid and vascular biology club meeting that happens quarterly and yeah, it sounds exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we we you know, I had been going to that basically since I started my PhD and he had you know he'd been going to that for a really long time as well and we've overlapped in, in many um, different types of um, events like that. So uh, when I first started the lab, he basically understood that I was really into lipid metabolism and I was highly, highly considering getting into a faculty position, and so he said, "Listen, I, you know, there's the, I'm just, there's a chance that I'll be retiring around the same time that you're going to be doing, uh, looking for your faculty positions. I'm happy for to hand over your project so that you can take it further." So I actually, wow. it wasn't even, it wasn't even that I didn't, uh, you know, I had a lot of uh, opportunity to try to pursue a faculty position. I just, it was, it was. It was really the location that that drew me away from it, right. and um, so anyway, when I started getting involved in a lot of these science communication initiatives, he was really supportive. You know, I wasn't there as, and I, it probably was because I always made sure that my lab work came first. My I always produced my data. I wrote my grants. I wrote my manuscripts, and without any kind of um, dent in my workflow in the lab, and so. He didn't really care if I wanted to blog all the time or hang out on Twitter for a little bit to chat with some people about science. You know, it wasn't it wasn't it was a non-issue. So you know, going back to, to something that you said that he he really supported you in terms of kind of finding out what career you wanted to pursue. So you know, you're you're in lab, you made the decision to leave. What was what was the next step for you? What was the next process where you decide, okay, this isn't what I want to do? You know, mm -hmm. How did you go about finding what you did want to do? Yeah, so he, we started talking about a number of different things, and um, we first started to um, potentially talk about going into industry. You know, we, there's been a really uh, a precedent set for people coming out of the lab to either get a faculty position or to go into industry. So, for instance, um, one of his students from the 90s was uh, rose really high in Merck and is now leading up one of the groups at Sanofi. So, um, and that was sort of one of the one of the examples by which I could uh, live by and, and try to use that to figure out my own career trajectory. And so. I started interviewing in some industry places and looking at what's available at the pharma and biotech companies around here. Um, you know, I did some preliminary interviews. I went on a couple of face-to-face -face interviews, and I mean, I did my best, and I definitely uh, brought my game, my you know, my game, my top game, or whatever they say those youngins. And yeah, and and but I just didn't feel it. I just felt like what I was doing was I was. I was I was presenting something because that was what I was supposed to do and not because it was what I wanted to do. So, I mean, I've given these job, these industry job talks before, but I just didn't feel it. And, and maybe that 
was that was somehow translated in in these things, and that's probably why I actually never got a job offer for industry. <laughs> you know, uh, among other reasons, I don't know. And so uh, I had to reevaluate what I wanted to go into, and I just decided, okay, well, let me let me let me give science writing a try. And so I started writing for Natural Selections, which is the newsletter here on the Rockefeller campus. It's it's a pretty old newsletter, so it has a, a nice rich history to it. Um, and it, I just realized, wow, I love this. I love writing. And I never had the confidence to really put myself out there. I didn't I didn't think I was a good writer until I started writing and I started getting feedback from people being like, oh wow, I really liked your article in Natural Selections. Um, keep it up, you know, nice job kind of thing. And I was like, you know what? Natural selections is great, but let's let's take this one step further. And so I started a blog. And then once I started the blogging, I realized the importance of um, social media, and I started getting on Twitter, and I started realizing the importance of science communication. And then once I, I recognized that and I found this community of like-minded people, I was just like, oh my god, this is this is it. I want to be a science communicator. And I want to do things that help promote science and science education, but it took me a long time to realize whether that would be formal ed education or informal education or, you know, where that would lie. Like, it, would I be going to a museum? Would I be going to a high school or something like that? Or, or, or staying at a uh, at a research institution? And so it took me a while, but I finally I finally found my way. So you know, I think it's totally worth mentioning at this point. You 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 made the decision to leave. You started um, tweeting and blogging, and when when I started doing social media very very lightly last year, one of the first things I noticed, and and I said this before, is that you were everywhere. <laughs> um, you do Google Plus. You're on Twitter. You um, at that point in time were when you're the sci you're still the, the bio biology editor for Double X Science, mm -hmm. um, and what I find amazing about this career path up to where you are now is that a lot of these are opportunities. It sounds like you created for yourself. Absolutely. Um, and so I, I love hearing the story about how you landed where you are now. So can you tell tell the audience about? how you became the director of science outreach? Oh, sure. So um, I had, once I realized I wanted to be a science communicator, I started just applying for a number of different positions. And I was in the running for some really nice positions, but I was always, you know, they, they would always say, okay, it's between you and another person, but unfortunately that other person would get hired over me. And I just was thinking about my future, thinking about, the fact that as a postdoc, you don't get retirement. Um, I was kind of tired of being in my mid-30s and having, you know, the pay of an entry-level person that's in their mid-20s um, as a postdoc. So I was really getting frustrated from a financial and sort of life planning standpoint. Uh, and um, I mean, the opportunities that you get here are wonderful, but honestly, postdocs are just not paid what they're worth. And trying to live it's a simple, in New York City it's a simple, on a postdoc salary. Pardon? Trying to live in New York City on a postdoc. Not only, salary. yeah, but you know, not only that is like you know, I, 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 I'm not just living for me. There's, I'm responsible for a number of different people, and I'm responsible for tuitions. I'm responsible for, you know, rent or, God forbid, I could even secure a mortgage. You know, so, um, I was getting so I, I really wanted to find a career that was. Um, I wasn't going to settle for some, doing something I didn't want to do, but I also wasn't. I also wanted to make a decent enough living so that I wasn't going to have to, you know, worry that I'll never have enough for a down payment for a house or, or something like that. Right. And um, so I, I, so I kept on getting all these job rejections in these science communications realms, and I felt really frustrated. So I basically created this science. Uh, communications manifesto, and I asked for an interview with our president of Rockefeller, um, Mark Tessier Levine. You know, and I basically, I, I was able. He gave me he gave me some time because um, he's honestly like one of the nicest people out there. And I sat down in his office. I presented him like a portfolio of uh, science communications initiatives, uh, philo the philosophy of science communication, and why I believe Rockefeller 
could be one of the thought leaders in just being um, a con you know a connected entity with with the public world and how what that means for public funding, what that means for just general uh, advancements and understanding of science, and what that means for people who are consumers and why we have an obligation to do this and. And then I said, and I'm the person to do this for us, <laughs> you know. And he looked at me and he's like, this is an excellent packet, um, but did you know that we, are, oh, we have an opening in our science outreach department as the director of science outreach? And I was like, oh, and I did not. And it was something that I guess had just happened like within the, the, the day or two before I did that. And I was like, thank you very much. I'll be right. I, I'll, uh, thank you for your time. And I basically left, applied for the job. And the rest is history. I got the job. So, um, and and I think it's because when I went in there, I was I was clear, I was concise, I was to the point, and I was enthusiastic. And I think I made an impression. And and mm -hmm. I was given that job because of these types of forward forward efforts. Right. One thing that I've I've found in talking to people who you know graduate students and postdocs who are considering leaving. A common roadblock that, that a lot of people have, including me for sure, was that I did not think that my training as a scientist could translate to anything else. I would always short sell myself. It's like, well, I'm a systems visual neuroscientist. Who's going to want to do that? Um, and a great thing I like about your story, among, among you know, many things, is your ability to recognize how broadly applicable your skills were to any number of different arenas mm -hmm. and your 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 ability to sell yourself well and i think that that's something that a lot of graduate students and postdocs just don't do so you know if, if you could tell people you know what what do they need to do to sell themselves what, what do they need to do to work up the gumption to go to someone and say hey give me some of your time i've got a great idea and I'm the person to execute on that idea. Uh, I, I will admit, um, doing something like that is not something that necessary, necessarily comes uh, came very naturally to me. I mean, you, you've known me for a little while, and most of the people who know me in, in my current form um, see me as an extrovert. But it took me a really, really, really long time to build up the self-confidence to be able to do those types of things. Um, I, I didn't. You know, and I, I think I, I follow, if you look at any of the statistics of, like, where, uh, why uh, females are underrepresented in a lot of the STEM fields, the science, technology, engineering, and math fields, you'll see that come around middle school, they stop, uh, they, their confidence level in themselves drops. And that was me. You know, I, w I, w I went to a school where boys were given the opportunities to skip grades and boys were given the opportunities to go into these cool math type things and the girls were basically told, okay, here's a cheerleading uniform, go for it, you know? And so I, I started kind of learning through these things that sci even though science, I mean, I could sit down and, and, and take one of these science tests like with eighth grade or, or seventh grade and just fly through it and ace it, but I, it didn't occur to me that that's something I could do, even though it was something that was always in my heart, if that's as, as kind of cliche or cheesy as that, that, that sounds, like I, I, I loved it from like day one. And so um, I, I, didn't, I didn't really feel like I could just walk up to someone and say, hey, uh, my name is Jeannie and you should talk to me, you know? And, and I, I felt like I was coming across as being conceited or I was coming across as being a know-it-all and I, I didn't want to do that. So um, I started feeling like, you know, when I was getting into grad school that, you know, when people, when I would, I, I kind of would start asking questions because I was really curious and I didn't start asking questions until like in our little seminars and, until I knew the people around me and I felt comfortable with them around me. Like, oh, these are normal people. I can ask questions. I started asking questions and then all of a sudden I just was the person that people started going to, like, what do you think? You know, can you help me with my project? And I was like, uh, oh, okay, yeah. Like, what? Like, why are you coming to me? And they're like, well, because we, re we really think that you can provide us some good feedback, uh, you know? And, and that was either in science, in the, like something to do with science, or just 
something to do with the culture of lab work. I, I just ended up being the ear that a lot of people um, talked to because they were having issues in lab or they were having um, issues with their PI or a specific uh, lab mate or they were having issues with something else that wasn't uh, related to science at all. And I was kind of like the unofficial um, go-to person to to troubleshoot these things, and I was like, wow, okay, I, I guess people are valuing my input, so that's, that's kind of interesting. And then that that kind of morphed into being like, you know what, I, I shouldn't be so afraid to speak up, I shouldn't be so afraid to talk to someone, and I started repeating this little mantra, you know, the, the worst that can happen is that someone says no, and what's going to happen to me if someone says no? Nothing. I'm going to be exactly where I am, exactly where I am right now, and I'm just going to move on. And it's just just not being afraid to go up to someone, not being afraid to hear the word no, and just being like, okay, moving on. And having that mindset has helped me to kind of be able to talk to people. And I have to tell you, this is probably something I shouldn't admit to the entire internet, but I always picture that scene in that movie, Half-Baked, when <laughs> that guy quits the fast food job. You're yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah, with the expletives and stuff. And so I always picture that. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> That's me right now. I'm, I'm just going to do it. it it's great. It, 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 you know, it, it takes, it, for anyone listening or, or watching who thinks it's, it's easy to get to that mindset, it is not. Not at all. Not at all. I, you know, I, my, my own personal thing is I, I had graduate school figured out. I had, you know, most things came easy to me when it, when it came to science. And when I left though, man, throwing myself out into the job market was brutal. It was soul crushing. Like, and, and you know how you're saying it, the worst that, that people can say is no. And what does it matter? Every rejection letter I got, I took it personally. And that's just how something. How not? Like, how can you not? But that's the point, is like, you're not the only one getting that that rejection letter, you know? And there's nothing you can do about it. You cannot go back and be like, hello, why did you give me this rejection letter? I need to know this. I need to know this right now. And Wait, you mean it's not okay for me to come back on my hands and knees begging for a <laughs> Yeah, probably not. Uh, maybe it'll work. I don't know. But honestly, the, the, the best thing, you know, have yourself, you know, a a little pity party and that's cool to take a day to feel sorry for yourself and that's important I think it's important to, to sort of let it out and then wake up the next day if it's possible and just you know what moving on next let's see what's going on here and just pick yourself up so moving on next you are <laughs> now the, the the director of science outreach at Rockefeller University so what is that what do you do on a kind of like a the day-to-day -day basis and sure. and tell us about all the exciting new stuff that you're doing right now. Oh, I love my job. It's probably, um, if I were to map out like my dream job, it would be this job. I love this job so much. And so uh, the cornerstone of this program is a seven-week research program for high school students. Uh, we had about 400 applicants this year and I was able to let in 35. I read over 400 applications, line by line. So if anybody wants to know why I didn't answer emails from like, you know, January through uh, the end of February, that is why. I'm sorry. So um, what, what's the name of the program and is this program open to anyone in high school or is it just around the New York City area? Um, it's the Summer Science Research Program. We call it SSRP and um, it is uh, unofficially limited to the New York area, so greater New York area. We have students coming from New Jersey, from um, Connecticut, New York, multiple places in New York, um, from primarily New York City or Westchester, which is the suburb outside of New York City. Mm -hmm. And um, we can take someone who is 16 and older uh, because of New York State law. You cannot come into a laboratory unless you are 16 years of age or older. And so, and then I pair them with a, uh, a research mentor. So someone, either one of the PIs here, we have 73 labs here at Rockefeller. And usually it's a postdoc or a student who will take on um, one of these high 
school students. And they'll mentor them for seven weeks, and these students will get their own project. Well, I'll be teaching um, or facilitating courses on helping them to think critically, helping them to understand pseudoscience from, from real science. Um, I'm going to, and my stamp on this would be, you know, helping them to understand the value of communicating science and the value of social media in doing that. Um, I'm also going to help them understand how to put together like a scientific presentation, your traditional poster type thing, because that's what the uh, the endpoint is. It's it's this poster presentation, and a la scientific meetings. And um, along the way, we're going to do some cool things. Like I'm going to um, I'm actually partnering with the Story Collider, and we're going to have a Story Collider here, hopefully giving um, the opportunity for a couple of the high school students and and possibly some of our college students that are coming in in our other program called SURF. It's a summer undergraduate research fellowship um, that's run by our dean's office here at Rockefeller. And we're going to have a, a cool event. And the goal of this is to help encourage public speaking and, under, and have them get a, um, more confidence in speaking uh, in public forums. And so this whole thing is going to be a really amazing. Um, I've always been on the other side of it. I've mentored some of these high school students before. Um, or some of these college students, but I've never, you know, run the program, so this will be my first summer, and I'm really looking forward to doing that. Um, but in addition to the SSRP, um, we have, so I'm involved in outreach, and outreach is basically defined in, like, a, a million different ways. So, you know, I do, I do a lot of social media type of engagement. Um, I go to schools and I give talks around New York City. I um, try to match students or postdocs with schools in New York City for them to do some things. Um, I will bring entire classrooms here and spend a day with them to talk about neuroscience or, um, you know, hepatitis C kind of disease transmission because that's one of our strengths here at Rockefeller. We have a really big neuroscience strength, and we, um, I think about 50% of our labs have something to do with neuroscience. So, um, yeah, and, and, we, and Charlie Rice, who is here, is one of the, the leaders in hepatitis C research, and so I'm working with a few members of his lab to try to de develop a curriculum to, that's applicable for um, high school students and bring them in. I have a lab. Um, we'll do experiments uh, uh, and, and just get them interested in science. Uh, in any way that I can. And I'm, I'm looking specifically to find um, schools that are underfunded and underserved and, and let these kids know that there are opportunities here for you. Let's do it together. And I should mention all of our programming is absolutely free. Like I, we raise money and we do it, you know, we, we provide these services pro bono because we, we understand that this is a luxury and we need to share that. So we need to share our knowledge with the broader community, and we'd like to do it. I'd like to do it through through students. It, it, yeah, it's admirable. It, so you know, getting back to the, the idea of, of your skill sets as a, a graduate student, and then transitioning to to your your new position, you know, what what skill set what, what skill has surprised you? In, in your new role that you're like, oh, wow, I learned that as a grad student, and I'm shocked that, that it actually works here? Um, questions, asking questions. Um, so I've always, so as you know, you're training graduate students to be very analytical, to ask the right questions, not just ask any question, but ask the right question. And then you're hopefully that answer will lead you down a path that will bring you towards some material or some tidbit of knowledge and then you can ask another question you know and um, I think that's really helped me in 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 just what I'm doing like am I, I'm asking questions like what can I do to help these kids understand science how can I do it um, how can I be effective how can I be efficient how do I know what I'm doing is working and so I feel like having this very analytical scientific mindset is helping me to design a program that perhaps in the near future can somehow be quantified, if not uh, at least defined. So then, you know, I guess the, the flip side is what, what skills do you wish you had learned um, before making the jump? Um, I wish that we learned like staff management 
Um, <laughs> I think a lot of PIs wish they had learned that too. Yeah, I think so. I think staff management is huge. Um, I also feel like it's important to learn lay communication in your science. Uh, I, I think, you know, I didn't realize science communication was even a thing until I started like getting into Twitter and blogging. I mean, I, I had you know I had no problem talking about like apolipoprotein A1 and how it related to high density lipoprotein and throwing out all this like blah 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 jargon because I'm like, well, why why do you need to know as what grandma? Why do you need to know these things? Because this is not your career. Your career is something else. And then I realized, well. She does need to know these things because she's sitting there reading her bottle of Lipitor, just being like, high density lipoprotein, you know, and, and like, or like, you know, whatever that means, a statin, uh, HMG CoA reductate, like, what is this stuff, you know? And, and so I realized putting two, two, two and two together that um, you, you need to be a consumer. You are a consumer of science. If you are walking on this planet and you are breathing oxygen, you are a consumer of science. And there's so much pseudoscience going on out there. And there's so much nonsense and non-science going on out there. And people are making these horrible decisions that are often far-reaching, whether they have to do with public policy, whether they have to do with education, or their personal health, that um, it, it's just, it's just a an atrocity that we aren't sharing what we know with the broader with the water public. And so that's that's why I, I feel very strongly that scientists need to communicate. But I also understand the boundaries or I understand the, the roadblocks rather um, for why scientists may not communicate. And that's why I'm here. I'm trying to basically facilitate um, and provide a platform so all they have to do is just say something and I can and I can put it out there for them. Because and that's why I launched the incubator, the incubator launch. That's going to be my next question. Yeah. You know, so you know, in your role, you, you're 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 helping to translate Rockefeller University scientists and their words uh, to the public via the incubator, and this yeah. is the the blog site for Rockefeller University. That's right. Yeah. So um, I kind of started the incubator several years ago under the radar um, when I realized I wanted to do blogging when I wanted to do science writing. Um, and it was just me and two other, uh, a really great postdoc, who you, um, at the time, she's now at Safari, you're interviewing her, uh, Jessica Wright. Um, she's a, we met here at Rockefeller and we started blogging together on the incubator. She left and I moved on to different things and the incubator lay dormant so that when I joined here, I was like, you know, I talked to my, to my, you know, the, my, my higher ups and I was like, why don't, why, is it possible for me to, um, Kind of resurrect the incubator and use it as part of our outreach, and they were like, "Yeah, totally, that's a great idea." So um, I resurrected the incubator, and then I started recruiting people to start writing for me. I have some wonderful graduate students and postdocs and a few faculty members that are contributing, and uh, it's really—I can't even tell you—it's been since January at, that we've resurrected it, and uh, we've been this week. We were syndicated on PopSci, and we got boinged today, so that was really exciting. And we were also um, placed on Ted's list of 100 websites you should know and use. And I, I was, I, I'm just blown away at how cool this has been and how well received these are, and, and the and the people that are are contributing and putting in the time to edit all the pieces and putting in the time to promote and, and to solicit. Um, contributions from other people. I, I'm just so honored that these people are so uh, interested and uh, committed to, to this uh, incubator vlog, and it's it's been a really cool thing. You know, it, it's amazing. One of the things that I hear from people who who want to leave science is that they want to go into a career that has uh, a more immediate impact than the, the research that are that they're doing. And I think the incubator and your work with it is almost an extreme example of doing something that has immediate impact. I mean, just like you said, you 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 relaunched this in January, in January, which is not more than you know three months in the past, and yet already, I can only imagine that you have hundreds, if not thousands, of people being impacted by the science that you're communicating, and so you know. For all the people out there who are thinking about leaving, who who 
who want to do something where they can see the result of their work, you know, just oh, an yeah. incubator. To, it's yeah. kind of, it's instant gratification. So if you need that, which is always nice for the ego, I'm not going to lie, but, um, but you have to make sure you do it right. You know, um, we, we definitely put a lot of time editing in the post. We really want to make sure our stories are clear and well written. Um, I've actually brought in a couple of science writers to help, um, to help with our uh, science writing skill set, and I've also brought in an, uh, an editor to help with that. We we just hosted uh, Carl Zimmer came to give us a science writing workshop. We had Charles Troy give us a science writing workshop, and we even had um, Robin Lloyd, who's the news editor at Scientific American, to um, help us understand the world of editing. So. Not only is the incubator great for giving back to the community, but what it does for graduate students and postdocs is it provides them an opportunity to try out and hone a different skill set. And that's science writing for the lay audience. So if anybody wants to go into publishing, um, you know, being an editor at a journal, or writing for a lay magazine, or just being a grant writer, or anything that involves a medical writing or whatever, um, they they can get some experience here, so it's kind of both ways. It's, I'm I'm trying to do something that benefits both the community at large, but also our community here at Rockefeller. And you know, it, it, we shouldn't just stop at talking about you know your your the work that you for as, as director of, of science outreach, because in addition to that, uh, I've already mentioned you, you tweet you're the science you're bi the biology editor at uh, Double X Science. Mm -hmm. You also co-host the Spot on New York City. And uh, just recently, you're, you're part of the Neurodome project. So, you know, can you tell, tell us a little more about both of those projects? And sure. I'll probably keep listing off everything you're involved in, but I'll stop. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll start with Double X Science. Double X Science is probably one of the most my most favorite things I've ever done in my life. Um, it's a really, we have a really great team of people led by Emily Willingham, who is the editor in chief. And, um, and we basically try to write articles with a female audience in mind. Uh, we, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a feminist through and through, and I like to stand up for women's rights and I like to stand up for women's rights in particular in science. Uh, or in STEM fields, and um, and so Double X Science is a really uh, wonderful platform to communicate these things. But I also like to do things that are very comedic. So I'll talk a little bit about pregnancies and stuff like that, and in a in a kind of a comedic um, uh, context. Uh, I like to write in in comedic verse, I guess. At least I think it's funny. I don't know if anybody else does, but uh, it's a good time for me. But also try to address more important issues like why do we need birth control? Or get your hands off my uterus, homeboy. You know, like kind of stuff like that. Um, so uh, that's a really, I, I just love, so doublexscience.org. And Spot On NYC, that's uh, something that I co-organized with um, Nature.com, Ars Technica, and uh, it's a partnership between uh, Nature, Ars, and Rockefeller. And um, the people that are involved in that are Joe Bonner, who is the Director of Communications here at Rockefeller, uh, John Timmer, who is the Science Editor at Ars Technica, and Lou Woodley, who is the Community Specialist at Nature.com. And so we got together kind of through me going up to someone and saying, I want to do something, and I want to do something for New York City, and I want to do something surrounding um, science communications. And she says, well, I know just the person that you need to talk to, and it's Lou Woodley. And so I approached Lou Woodley. We had a phone chat, and the rest is history. And not only have we been able to provide two years of these really cool science discussions that are open to the public, and anybody can come, um, but we've developed a really awesome friendship. I have to say, Lou Woodley is probably one of my best friends, like, ever. I, like, I love the girl. So um, it's been a really awesome experience for, for me to do that. And it's opened up a lot of um, 
uh, networking, and it's opened up a lot of relationships for a variety of people, including me. And then the Neurodome, uh, this is a really cool project. Uh, so a couple of neuroscientists here, in particular John Fisher, uh, who works, who's a postdoc right now in the Hudson lab here at Rockefeller, he's a neuroscientist, and he's had this dream of, of taking the brain and information that we have in the brain and, and presenting it in a way that's as sexy as space. And so he decided that he wanted to somehow build a planetarium show, but instead of flying through the stars, we're flying through neurons and showing that, you know, we are going to do, do these things. We are exploring space. We're exploring, you know, the bottom of the ocean. We are uh, climbing the top, the highest mountains here on Earth. Why, why do we do this? What makes humans want to explore? If we don't have to explore, right? We don't have to climb Mount Everest if we're going to survive as a species. But why do we do it? And so um, what he's doing is, is he's working, um, or he's uh, assembled a team that includes me, and we're working with neuroscientists and people that are in um, neuroimaging to create these really high resolution, three dimensional images of the brain and um, project them on a planetarium show, but in the context of a really exciting story. And I'm really excited to be involved in that. We have a Kickstarter going on right now where we're, we're uh, just above the 50% mark. So we're trying to raise $25,000 so that we can create a proof of principle video um, to show that this is possible and we should do this, so full steam ahead. And one of the cool perks of it, so if, you're, if your pocketbooks are very deep, <laughs> for a $10,000 donation, you can get your brain scanned in an fMRI machine. We have a relationship with um, Cornell New York Presbyterian, which is the hospital next door to Rockefeller. And you can have your brain be the images that we put in the Neurodome Planetarium show. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I I don't roll with anybody with that kind of with that kind of green, but um, maybe someone watching does. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. The the you know I think it's important to mention you're over fifty percent there, but you only started a week ago, two weeks ago. We uh, I think we're about two weeks in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's mm -hmm. we. You know what? We got. A, we really were able to um, energize the Kickstarter base. We got put on as Kickstarter's uh, uh, pick of the week, and we also got included in Kickstarter's weekly newsletter. And that generated a significant amount of donations from that. I mean, I, I would say 50% of our donations have come from the Kickstarter base. So if anybody is interested in crowdfunding, you know. Kickstarter, if you're on and you're going to do crowd, uh, Kickstarter, I, I, I highly recommend it trying to tap into that, that Kickstarter community because it's a very tight-knit, it seems, uh, and wonderfully generous community. So science outreach, tweeting, Google+, Neurodome, Spot on New York City, is there, is there anything you can't do? Uh, well, okay, loaded question. So she's standing up? I don't know. <laughs> You could probably do that if you tried. I probably could. <laughs> uh, but you know, as we're as we're gonna wrap up here, what do you want? What's the takeaway message for for people who are considering leaving? You know, what what would be, you know, one or two pieces of key advice that you would give them as they're about to, you know, leave the nest of, of academia? Um, I would have a serious talk with yourself, and really make a list of things you love to do and things that you hate to do. And then think about careers that do not overlap with the column, uh, with any of the subjects under the column of things you hate to do. Um, and because I, I think if, I, I ultimately believe that uh, you, you should be happy in what you're doing um, and, and that should come first. And um, and then so once you realize perhaps a, an area that you might like, uh, start networking and moving towards um, talking to people that are in that area. Uh, now uh, that's not to say that people don't always know what they want to do. So then I would suggest 
go to talks, see what clubs are happening in your university. Um, so like for instance here we have a biotech forum, we have um, a science and media club, we have a consulting club, we have a journal, like you know general journal editing kind of things um, going on. So I, I think that you know, join those clubs. See who else is in there. Find a like-minded individual and discuss. You know, what are the resources that that person has? What are the resources that you have? You know, do a transaction. Give them something and take away something. Um, get yourself. No matter what field you want to go into, get yourself. Um, get your science communication skills honed because it doesn't matter where you want to go. People want to make sure that you can talk and that you can. Right, and that's a skill set that's really important. Whether you're going into finance, um, tech transfer, into writing, or anything, you you really need to hone in your communication skill set um, and your public speaking skill set, and just try to network in whatever way you can network. Um, whether that's going, like I said, going into these clubs, getting on Twitter, getting on Facebook. Facebook is a remarkable uh, means to interact with people. Remarkable. I think 70% of all internet users are on Facebook. Wow. Which means, you know, that CEO guy that might be able to give you an interview might be on there. That, you know, just just find the people or the groups that you want to kind of that subscribe to that are overlap with your vision and and get on there. Um, yeah, and then just see what's local and, and try to get involved in that. And talk to people. You never know. You just never know that you're you know, your, your dad's workout buddy might have a connection. Just always bring it up and just like, yeah, I'm thinking about going into here. And you just never know. So, folks, network, be bold. Don't be afraid to throw yourself out there. Yeah. Um, the, like Jeannie said, the worst that people can do is say no. So That's right. Thank you very much, Jeannie, for taking what, the time. One more thing. Um, oh. This may not be, well, I don't know if I should be saying this in public, but I also think it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Yeah. So, who knows where it could lead you. Follow Jeannie on Twitter. Follow her on Google+. Uh, if you haven't yet, I know I already did, um, uh, take the time to go to kickstarter.com and uh, find Neurodome and give some of your hard-earned cash to a great project. And or, if you can't donate, share it. You know, that's just as powerful. On, on the Facebook that I've heard lots of people use now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks again, Jeannie, and thanks Thank to everyone you, who's been watching. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.